folks on the call. Um, so, um, Anil, uh, are you there? I am here. <laughs> um, great, uh, great, how are you doing? Um, well, you, you sent out that email. Uh, so uh, anyone who's um, listening to this call, you can safely assume they're subscribed to the CCG mailing list. So they they have the they they have the report out email. But um, yeah, what what would you like to present about it, and what would you like to discuss? I actually um, you know, didn't want to blind you with uh, PowerPoint or slide there, right? So I think uh, I've done enough of that, uh, you know. So uh, just for the record, <laughs> Stephen, I am totally and absolutely jealous uh, of the uh, the beautiful UI and the documentation that you have around the test suite that you guys have built, right? So, so um, you know, we should all aim for something of that quality and that comprehensiveness. That's a nice job. And yeah, that's yeah. one of the things that we are absolutely lacking in the work around the HTTP, you know, VC HTTP API and some of the test suites that we have. It, it is actually a, a challenge and it's something that I hope that uh, we can address, uh, you know, going forward, right? So, but but uh, that, that, is, that, is, that is an awesome, that's an awesome piece of work there. So, um, I, I I don't like I said I don't, I don't want to blind you with science in general. I will I will let me just forward to a, one particular slide here, um, and uh, I'll just open it up for you know questions at that point in time because I think it, it feels as though um, all right this is uh, I am not used to sharing. Okay, never mind. I, you know what I am I'm not going to share um, because I'm not used to sharing on a. a, a one of the challenges for, for working for DHS is that Google infrastructure is actually blocked for me. So I actually be on, be on my personal computer in order to get on a um, you know, Google plus uh, Zoom um, uh, call. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, if whatever. But long and the short of it is, I know that the key there is, I think we, we obviously had our first plug fest back in May of last year. Um, you know, we've, we've sort of focused on um, ensuring interoperability, you know, using a set of constraints, those constraints being, you know, and I'll focus on JSON LD, linked data signatures, um, uh, you know, verifiable presentation requests and support from multiple wallets and other types of mechanisms. And in the plug fest that we just finished up, you know, over the last uh, week or so, uh, we were testing everything that we tested back in the day but we also you know, ensured that the things that we were using were because I need the companies in our portfolio to be uh, eventually be able to integrate with federal government systems. Uh, the cryptographic primitives that they're using needs to be FIPS compliant. We were very interested in testing you know, VC aggregation and presentation using, using verifiable presentation. Um, uh, to your point, uh, Stephen, regarding uh, revocation, yeah. Uh, revocation list 2020 uh, piece that actually uh, understand your concerns. We, we shared the same thing, which is why I think that implementation, if done correctly, provide a measure of herd privacy that sort of does not break the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, does not break the concern, does not reintroduce the concerns that we have with the, the phone home problem between an issue, a verifier and an issuer, right? So that was something that was uh, critically important. I was very surprised by uh, the companies in our portfolio whereby we did not have, uh, for example, um, a selective disclosure uh, with BBS signature as an interop target specifically. Um, it, it actually ended up having that uh, there were at least four companies that implemented it. And, you know, there was uh, at least a, uh, one company from our, uh, you know, uh, supply chain, a digital credential cohort, Transmute, that actually implemented them as a uh, completely out of the uh, out of the blue. So nice work, Ori, on that one. Um, obviously, a secure key also implemented that capability as well as a matter. Um, we were using DidWeb. Um, we actually do believe that there is a role for DidWeb when it comes to uh, the identification of issuers and verifiers, not for uh, representing uh, holders. Right, we believe there are significant privacy concerns when it comes to uh, using did web for uh, you know assigning a did web uh, to an individual so but we are very interested in leveraging our uh, uh, 
our uh, existing infrastructure around both DNS as well as uh, web infrastructure in how we can use um, you know, did web without a dependency on a ledger platform um, for our purposes. We all fully understand some of the challenges around it, which we need to mitigate uh, regarding uh, how do you keep track of uh, uh, you know, changes to the, the, the document, who are the controllers, change management. Those are things that need to be resolved and we will resolve them. But uh, those are some of the things that we tested within the, within the environment as well. The other piece that we, we definitely were very interested in is, again, given our foundational piece on JSON-LD, um, we have a driver uh, where uh, we don't have the luxury of serving just a specific community um, uh, that are only technically savvy. So equity in the solutions, access to solutions that bridge paper, lo-fi digital, all the way to fully digital uh, experience is critically important, whether it is for our high value credentials like a permanent resident card or for uh, anything related to vaccination certificate. So we spent a lot of time thinking through um, you know, using the same infrastructure across paper, lo-fi digital, and fully digital uh, that allows you to issue and verify and the ability to combine, you know, JSON-LD, uh, link data signatures uh, with Seabor LD as a compression mechanism that allows us to fully round trip a QR code uh, across, you know, JSON-LD, a QR code back to a JSON-LD that maintains the integrity of the digital signature across them is pretty powerful. Uh, and the fact that we can uh, represent something in a QR code that actually uh, uh, does not require an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper is a big deal. Um, so those were things that uh, we are actually, you know, uh, it, it tried out, tested out. Uh, we will more than likely, uh, not more than likely, we will have, uh, even though there was, um, again, surprisingly, multiple companies tested out, interrupt, without it being a formal interrupt target, which is one of the, the nice, uh, nice opportunities in this setting. But uh, we expect to have some formal interrupt targets around uh, QR code with Seabor LD uh, in an upcoming plug fest. And the other piece that we are uh, very much going to be focused on is support for um, in a VC refresh by the holder only. Um, in general, you know, uh, if any of you um, like me have ever been permanent residents of the United States and permanent, you get a permanent resident card, uh, when, they, uh, when you go through the process of extending a permanent resident card, what they do is smack a sticker on top of your existing permanent resident card, which is completely hokey. So uh, our USCIS folks are very interested in uh, making that much more easier and flexible for anybody who might have a digital permanent resident card. But we are also very concerned about uh, you know, the caveats that are clearly articulated uh, in the VC uh, standard itself around how you might, if you're going to be doing refresh, you can enable it only uh, as something that is initiated by the holder back to the issuer, or it is something that could be uh, requested by the verifier. We are explicitly not supporting the verifier call back to the issuer because we believe that it runs counter to um, you know, the, the, the agency and the control that we need to give uh, the holder in how their information is used. And if you give that uh, option to the verifier, um, it can bypass uh, the holder and the person that is holding the credential. So we're very interested in, uh, uh, you know, VC refresh um, uh, that is uh, that is that is provided to the to, to the holder only. So I could keep blathering on. Um, I have uh, you know folks obviously from the uh, from our uh, from our cohort on the line, both from our you know digital person credential uh, group as well as our digital uh, supply chain um, you know credential group as well. Happy to answer any questions. Talk about where we are going, what we are what we're doing, what our plans are. You know what 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 the goals are. So consider this an opportunity, you know, ask me anything. Uh, if I can answer it, I can, I will. If I cannot, I will tell you why not. Uh, uh, and if I don't know the answer, I will plead ignorance. Um, so, so go for it. Um. Okay, um, the floor is open if people have questions. Um, I'll ask a question. John. Sure. 
And it's me, yeah. I thought I'd say hi too, although I'm kind of bundled up right now. I'm kind of chilly. The uh, nervous system doesn't work as well as it used to. So the thermostat gets confused, but I thought I would say hi. It's good to see so many familiar faces and, and also just to uh, say thank you for your support over the last months. It was great. I got a nice card from the DIFT community. I've looked at it many times, I can say. Um, I'm super sad that uh, I missed Stephen's presentation because I had a bad link or something. And I kept asking for a code and I was texting and texting. I'm like, oh. But anyways, it sounded like it went well. Um, and I'm really happy about where we're at in terms of, uh, you know, the sort of supporting all the, the best ideas from all the different communities, I hope and showing like, like a nail, like we've always been very dedicated to interoperability and open standards. So, so that's really important. And um, I think the nail, like, and I don't know how it works just yet, but I'm hoping that we can get some way to have some of the, whatever we call them agents, you know, connected into the test harness so that we can start using those automated tests and stuff. I think that would be a really nice sort of aspiration. I don't know exactly how it technically works, but that would be pretty neat. Absolutely. So one of my frustrations has been, so I will simply be you know, very direct and say that um, in the when we did the first plug fest, Chaffee became the default option for moving credentials between the issuer, the wallet, and the thing, simply because that was the only one that was ready to go. Uh, I keep looking for cross-platform, cross-stack interoperability, whether it is using DITCOM, whether it is using the OpenID Connect provider or, or a fallback to some sort of a QR code. Um, there are obviously, uh, you know, companies in my portfolio, uh, in particular, uh, SecureKey that are actually, you know, contributing pretty heavily to the, the Aries interop profile and things like that. So my hope is that I would love to, uh, I was hoping that there would be an opportunity to do a DITCOM version two interop within our thing, but there wasn't a counterparty that could we could hit against in our work. And that was depressing, right? So uh, I, I, I am frustrated by the fact that I think the, the Aries community and the Hyperledger community are, are doing some great work, but at the same time, uh, I need to show, similar to you, John, that there is no lock into one particular ecosystem or no one particular technology stack. So I'm, I, am, I am looking, I am actively looking for an opportunity to do a DITCOM version two interop with somebody uh, so that we can actually show it working with a non-indie, non-hyperledger platform with, with, with a you know, indie or a hyperledger uh, based platform, right? I really want yeah. to see that happening. Uh, I think we're getting pretty close. Yeah, we're extraordinarily yeah. close to that. So maybe we should um, figure out how to do between you, BC Gov and, and maybe even Jeff and Juan with his uh, code with us ideas. Maybe we can get somebody to build something. That'd be pretty wild. We so, can get there. We're very close. Uh, beyond that, right? So, so we also have companies in our portfolio that are actually doing some interesting work for the Canadian government right now as well. So Mavenet, who's in our uh, 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 Mavenet, and I think uh, Transmute as well. Ori, I don't, I don't want to speak for you. I think you guys are basically going to be doing some work in the Canadian context as well. Uh, uh, in addition to the work that you're doing um, for us, I think there is an opportunity at the you know cross border. Uh, I don't want my entire driver is not to do use cases. Uh, we are driving towards making sure that the capabilities that we're building are being put into place in order to solve the problems of my operational components. So every single piece of work that I'm doing, these are not use cases for us. These are shaping product in order to integrate them with our backend. So I want real counterparties 
that I can bang against on those particular problem set, whether it is import of oil, uh, import of natural gas, import of steel, import of e-commerce goods, import of uh, food and agriculture, or uh, you know, a, or or the presentation and verification of you know high value immigration and vaccination credentials. So, uh, yeah. Want to do that? I was saying to uh, Ruben when they announced uh, Veramo, like, like that would be a really neat to see that integrated into the, well, not integrated into, but to be one of those issuers, holders, or verifiers in a test scenario, you know, and that would be a completely new code base, could be uh, the Ethereum did type, um, so forth and so on. I mean, that would be our vision, right? Like, that would be a, Yes. Part of our vision, right? Do you? Yes, I'm pretty with you. And uh, the number two. Do you guys think we could define what would be like a minimum viable profile across this different like ecosystems? Because it seems like we have different priorities. Didcom seems to be one of the, the things we could like we all agree on. But what are the other components up and down the stack, uh, which we could yeah, work think... towards? I think that's doable. I mean, choose your own did method as long as it's publicly readable. Uh, did com, and then just basically, all, I mean, you would want to look at the, I think the um, credential exchange protocol and presentation exchange protocol that Aries, but then inside of that, choose your own verifiable credential data format and use the presentation exchange data format. And but I think that if I'm not oversimplifying, I think that, that that could work, you know, and I think we're like that close to it. Anyways, I mean, I agree. sounds like we all think we're getting pretty close to me. So maybe that's something we can work on over the next period as a, you know, a global set of interesting parties. It, 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 it's, a, it's a fair point, but Ruben, to answer your question, I, I think um, in, a, in a previous life, I used to be in the business of wielding the hammer of compliance against the anvil of organizational policy when it comes to certifying and accrediting identity services for the US federal government, right? And I learned during that experience that uh, there are a lot of shenanigans that come into play uh, when it comes to testing and, uh, test, uh, testing and conformance. And um, there, is, there was also a desire by very smart people to get in the room and define the profile first, and then try to get buy-in for that profile by multiple parties. Um, it, within at least the SVIP program, um, we're trying to take a different approach there. Uh, more from the other side, the reason we are uh, having these multi-party end by end matrix testing and plug fest is to sort of identify organically from the ground up what it takes to actually truly interoperate, not just be standards compliant, truly interoperate across them, clearly mm -hmm. document what those interop points are, then use that in order to create a profile that shows something working in real now is documented in a profile. I am, I am very leery of creating a profile, then shopping that around to get people to buy into it. So we are trying to do it the other way. So I fully expect uh, through the plug fest and the work that we're doing, that we will have a profile of you know, uh, verifiable credentials data model. We will have a profile of decentralized identifiers. We will have a profile of other pieces that all need to play together. And as you well know, profiles are basically, we are constraining choices to one so that everybody can you know, speak to the same thing. So that's the approach that we're taking. It is, it might be, it is often painful. Uh, I know that the companies in our portfolio um, get into their equivalent of shouting matches, but very politely because a lot of them are both Canadian and New Zealanders. So they're very polite people while even while shouting. Uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, so, so, so it is something that I, I think there is a shared interest uh, to, 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 to accomplish. So, uh, but I, for me and for our, what we're doing, we prefer to start from uh, demonstrated interoperability through a plug fest, then use that to create the profile rather than the other way. 
Um, yeah, maybe, I would also maybe, know maybe. in general, if we want to do an intra plug fest, maybe what we can do potentially is pick a couple of feature sets that everybody agrees mm -hmm. should be tested in general. For example, revocation seems to be a big deal. Uh, BBS plus signature seems to be a big deal and getting a lot of traction. Maybe we, we focus on just those features that we can bring together on multiple communities and multiple product vendors together in order to focus just on that, right? So that's an option as well. Yeah, I think maybe the, the terminology I used was profile might be uh, has different uh, meanings. I was thinking about can we can we define like you have objectives for your intro uh, plug fest? So if we can say we'll do a cross industry plug fest, uh, we're going to call this and define like what we be trying to do. Demonstration is we can use any of these like get methods. We can use didcom and then we do something on top with PBS Plus and JSON V, which seems to be kind of the easiest compromise we have across the, the industry. That would be maybe just like, don't even say that's profile. It's more like that would be an objective for us within a period of time to prove interoperability across the industry. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, for those who who looked at the test results from our Intra Plug Fest, you will notice something that is amusing in general, right? Every ever uh, with the exception of Marcus and Danutech, and 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 more credit to him. Everybody else had magical all green test suites that they passed, right? So, so, so I, I personally am amused by that uh, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, internally, uh, when they actually come to us with the actual test results as a contract deliverable, we will be going in depth about what are the test artifacts that they chose to test and what are the things that they did not. And in a future plug fest, I, I more than likely will expect them to run the entire test suite against them so that there are things for a business purpose or because of use case, a company might choose not to support. So failing a test is actually not a bad thing. It is indicating a concrete choice that you're making as a company or as an organization on what you choose to support. So, so I, I do think that we need honesty in articulating and sharing the testing and not everything is basically should be green all the time, that it is perfectly acceptable to have failing tests because that is not something that you support, right? So. Uh, sorry, Keith, Keith's poor hand has been up so long, it's probably numb. <laughs> Keith. <laughs> Hey, th thanks, Neil, for that update. I I'm always interested on your opinions on the cryptography and federal government. In particular, you know, I'm always, I think, you know, your project went to back to ED signatures, but then when we look at new signatures like, you know, BBS plus, how do you see that working with federal government, NIST, FIST, all that kind of great stuff? Because um, that's something I always think in the back of my mind is, well, if we use one of those, what does that mean for our work with federal or state governments? So uh, it's an interesting question, right? At, at the end of the road, I, I think I've, I've, after many conversations with members of our cohort, I've come to the realization that a lot of the questions around, you know, to blockchain or not to blockchain, DLT or not to DLT, or um, is basically just chaff, right? So I, I, I'm setting up the answer for you. Uh, what it comes down to from the perspective of an enterprise like ours is two things. Uh, and, and, and I'm using words that uh, uh, Ori actually uh, shared back in the day. One is political acceptability. And the other one is acceptable cryptographic primitives. Those are the two drivers for me. Political acceptability, um, are you anchoring yourself in a ledger that uh, if, a, uh, if, if, if somebody from uh, the government sector basically looks at it and says, oh, this is the ledger that basically is uh, being used for uh, illicit transactions to move a lot of massive, you know, massive amount of cryptocurrency in the, on the dark web, you're anchoring in that. That's not a path to success for us, right? So political acceptability of the ledgers that we anchor into is critical. The other one ultimately that we cannot get away from because you are connecting to government systems is the cryptographic primitives that are used for digital signatures, random number generations, uh, hashing, um, need to be FIPS compliant. And this is something that, uh, to be blunt with you, this is something that our companies actually forced me. They actually uh, uh, wrote a, you know, a, 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 
a seven page uh, uh, you know, letter with questions that they had, they needed answers to, that we finally got answers, you know, basically got answers from NIST uh, on them about uh, a lot of the cryptographic pro, uh, primitives that, that are acceptable and not acceptable and things like that. Um, I think, uh, you know, Ping me or bring any of our companies, it is shareable because uh, I personally have found that if you share it with one community, uh, there is no expectation that it will not go anywhere. And I've gotten permission from the NIST 186 team about sharing that information broadly. So ping me and I'll share, I'll share that letter that our companies asked uh, you know, me uh, to get answers for them uh, for, on the cryptographic primitives. Now, speaking particularly about BBS plus signatures, NIST actually did back in the day a lot of in-depth look at pairing-based cryptography back in the day. They actually have a very nice white paper on it uh, that I actually uh, references some of my slides as well, right? So at that point in time, they sort of left it as this is really, really interesting cryptography. It is really useful to government and uh, we need to do some work around it. I think the exact people, the two lead authors of it, who were the people who actually responded to some of our crypto questions about what have you done? And they said, well, we really haven't done much. And my comment back to them was, all right, in the absence, of, I've always operated under the uh, a philosophy that you ask for forgiveness, not for permission. So we are moving out on BBS plus signatures. We are we have an open door, uh, open invitation to NIST and the broader com cryptographic community in working with us to ensure that that uh, particular uh, you know cryptographic primitive is indeed something that is. Uh, testable. It is, uh, I have a red team that is going to be looking underneath the covers on the implementation of that as part of my work, but I also have an open invitation to NIST in order to, you know, guide us and provide us any information that they would feel is appropriate for how that should be implemented. But in general, I cannot be in a position where, um, selective disclosure in general is critically important for our use cases. At the same time, I do not believe, and I'll be very direct in say, saying that ZKPCL is not a path to success for us uh, uh, because uh, we cannot have a ledger locked implementation of uh, selective disclosure. So I am happy with the traction that the uh, BBS plus signatures is getting in, in all of the communities that we're involved in. And that is a path that we are moving out. And until somebody tells me no, with a reason that is rational rather than just a no, we will keep moving forward. We will uh, ensure that we independently test it with both cryptographers that we have available to us and also provide an opportunity to do that. That may not be a, a complete answer for you, Keith, but that's the best I got at this point in time. Oh, that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, Marcus? Yeah, um, An Anil mentioned my name when, when talking about failing tests, so, so I just wanted to um, comment on, on that. I think during the plug fest, I showed uh, about 150 passing tests and six failing tests, and I, I wanted to say this, uh, there's a difference between failing a test and not supporting a feature, right? So when it fails, it means that uh, it means that a feature is meant to be supported, but it failed. And uh, not supporting a feature is something else, right? So at least the uh, verifiable credential HTTP API test suite has the ability to uh, test certain features and not test certain features. So if you have an, an implementation that doesn't support certain things, then you can actively say that it doesn't support them and then they are not even tested. So if there's a test failure, then it does mean that uh, something that is supposed to be supported <laughs> failed. Uh, the reason for it can, can, however, be different reasons for that, right? One, one reason could be that there's a problem with the implementation, but another reason could be that there's a problem with the test, and the third reason could be that there's a problem with the specification or with the API definition. So just because there's a failed test in one implementation doesn't necessarily mean that it's the implementation that is wrong, and in, in the case of the six failed tests that I showed I would uh, actually argue for one or two of these tests, I would actively argue that it's not the implementation that is wrong, but that it's either the test or the specification is wrong. And I would even go as far as saying that some of the other implementations which display the green passing test in, in some cases actually implemented things the wrong way and that the test needs to be fixed and, and, and so on. So that's also part of the 
uh, the process that we all went through, I think, over the last few weeks and, and months. And that's that's also the, the value of this process, right, to figure out these uh, these details. Um, oh, Ori. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think we're probably running close to the end of the meeting, but I just wanted to say that um, getting people to contribute to tests and getting making sure that the tests are testing the right pieces that are easy for people to contribute to is hard. Um, and I've been, I've been very uh, uh, grateful to, to work with um, the other folks, both in SVIP and DIFF and in the CCG to um, make these tests uh, useful. And I, I, one word of caution, I, I love how much the ARIES test harness um, is able to cover by connecting through agents. And, and that's an example of you know, a very advanced integration mm -hmm. test. Um, and it can cover a tremendous amount of feature space by wiring all the way up to a you know, full agent and then testing all of that agent's features and functionality and testing discovery. And, that's really, really awesome. But that is also a huge amount of investment that has to be made to, to pass those tests. And everybody who's, who's contributed to those has done you know, a tremendous service to, to show how much of that ARIES feature set they can support. But it's not always the best way to get people to contribute to tests. Sometimes it's, it's faster if you can test things in, in isolation or smaller layers of integration. And it can also lead to some of the stuff we see in the VCHDP API, like Marcus mentioned, people can decide that they wanna support 50 different DID methods that they control. And then they've got hundreds of passing tests and which looks really great, right? But like this test isn't about DID methods, this test is about verifiable credentials. And anybody doing that is sort of cheesing the tests. And so it's another example of like, what are you really testing, right? Like you wanna make sure that the test suite is defining what exactly it is under test and that it's making sure that that you're you're not like basically putting a bunch of copies of the same kind of thing in there to make yourself look great. So I think we've got lots of work to do still on the VCH to DB API. Well, I, I did I did also want to say, I mean, it's also not completely either or. It isn't like the Aries interop profile tests entire frameworks of agent and you know multiple agents you if you're working on something that's just one little piece you can strap your one little piece in there and you know use other people's stuff for the other components and just test one thing but i also wanted to say that uh we we also got um uh, apologies i i also invited charles later from spruce uh to talk about how uh the vc http api um test suite can be containerized, spun up as a CI test. And you you can, uh, you know, similarly, if you're testing something that isn't a complete solution, but you want to run some subset of the tests just in your CI CD, just every time you merge domain, spin up a little, you know, agent and, and send the credentials and see if they verify things like that. And I think that's um, something I'd, I really think we should the documenting uh, and make that sort of a public service of this test suite, right? Um, so it's like, just to say that there's there's like a spectrum from whole system solutions to narrower tests, you know, uh, dis, dis, discrete tests, um, but sorry, <laughs> no, uh, well, that'll, I guess point, that'll I be a future that, meeting. Yeah. yeah, I'd also note that there is, I'll just say that uh, our, our testing suite uh, is improved since our, uh, you know, version one plug fest, um, mm. particularly from the perspective that all of the people um, who are doing the testing are seriously technical folks. And any of you, all of you know that you can make any test come out to be anything that you want. Uh, if it is, uh, it, you know, it can be gained. Tests, tests can be gained. And one of the things that I'm trying to make sure is to the extent that we can, if you're going to gain that test, it is going to take a significant amount of engineering effort on your part in order to do that, because I want to make that bar uh, as high as possible and painful as possible for you to gain any test. So that's going to take some time. 
And, uh, and uh, it's going to take some improvement. It's going to take some refinement as well. So at the end of the road, um, you know, we do not believe in the mystical nature that just because you got green, everything is great, um, uh, which is why we do have the, you know, N by N multi-party, um, you know, uh, testing as well, right? Just to make sure mm -hmm. infrastructures can actually talk to each other. Definitely. Um, well, uh, everyone, uh, so thank you so much for coming. And uh, the N by N testing is not, that's a good question. Charles asks, is the N by N testing public? And how would you answer that question, Anil? <laughs> so so you, the N by N testing tends to be um, uh, more of a demonstration of capability, somebody doing that. So what you will see that is, uh, if you look at the, the snippets of, so understand what we did over the last two weeks. So the first two weeks were actually uh, contractual deliverables delivered internally. Um, so each company spent about an hour with the government teams going over what they demonstrated, including showing their infrastructure working with the other vendors uh, infrastructure. So what we showed in these uh, on, on, on Thursday and what is captured in the, in the slides and things like that are sort of snippets of those two days that were more in depth. So end by end testing is, it'll be interesting to see if it can be automated. And I think if, any, if there is anybody who can talk to it is Mike, who has his hand up, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Anil. Um, yeah, and I know we're up on the end, but yes, I did uh, actually publish out um, Postman, Newman, uh, Command Line, uh, as well as Automatable uh, end by end for the supply chain mm -hmm. stuff. We will be bringing that model over to, you know, or something like it over into the VCH DTP API because it actually not only one checks to make sure the basics that are going on as far as can you issue, can you verify, are there all these things at the right endpoint, are they taking all the right, uh, you know, uh, parameter sets. Um, but then can the output of one thing go into the input of the next and down the line, right? And that's really when you get into seeing does this stuff actually work or not. And we ran that thoroughly against all of the supply chain companies. We're running full issuance on all the traceability credentials, obviously, as well. So it's really just can we keep building on that and make that, uh, you know, a little bit broader, so. Yeah, it's uh, a work in progress coming coming soon to a, a public facing test harness near you. Yeah, and the, the, that's actually published. Uh, that test harness is published up in the traceability vocab. So it's like you could pull it down, swap servers out and run it. What we need to do is just now set it up to run off of the configs that are already in VC HTTP API. That's probably the next step. So that's the one thing that, right. so I am not technically astute enough to actually explain this. But I know that uh, the supply chain group actually did a lot of work in everything from automatically generating, you know, uh, credential types to, you know, uh, running these tests and things like that, 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 that significantly automated the process from end to end. I have no idea how to even explain it. Uh, I'm going to defer to people much more intelligent than I, who actually know what the heck that they did to explain it like Ori or Mike, sure. um, you know, uh, you know how that was done. I'm hoping that that process, we can, we can sort of scale across our entire cohort of companies as well, because I thought that was yeah. actually very well done and it was automatable and scalable, right? So yeah. that's impressive. You, you don't want to have to manually generate your graphics to show that you're interoperable. Um, you don't want to have to do it you know, you know, every couple months, you want to make it so that anybody can go to a website and press a button and see who's live and who's not, and who's passing and who's not. And it should be on demand. Um, all of the reports should be automated. It should be handled in CI. Um, these are, you know, design principles that are part of making tests uh, enjoyable to, to, to work with, and also part of making you feel good when you pass the test. You merge your pull request, the test spins up, it shows you passing and it automatically generates a permanent URL for you to show that you're passing the test. These are just, you know, parts of participating um, in test suites that are 
honestly, like, if you don't do them, like nobody, nobody participates in the test suite. You, you have to, you have to make it comfortable for people to contribute. And we've spent a lot of time on the traceability vocab and in the VCH to API to provide that tooling for folks who want to show interoperability. And it looks like the Aries test harness has something very similar already set up, which is, is you know, cool. I mean, I think the more that this can be automated, the more that it can be made on demand, the higher everyone's confidence is in the test results. Yeah, it really, it really uh, proves maturity. But puts meaning behind the the label of production <laughs> production scale. Yeah, and great. one kind of final comment on the CI side. I mean, we're using that on the traceability mm -hmm. vocab to even accept pull requests. Like you have to be passing tests with the new object in order to push it in, um, and it's just a, that extra check and sanity check just to make sure that nothing. You know, yes, you should be striving for 100% tests all the time, right? Let's not even take code into the play, you know, uh, into the repo if it's uh, going to be breaking something. Definitely, um, and yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully, in a few months we'll have a interrupt meeting, just a show and tell of people's um, CI, CI, GitHub actions, and Travis's and whatnot. <laughs> um, 